So, welcome to Brooklyn Law School. Uh, my name is Nick Allard. I'm the president and dean of this great law school. It's wonderful to see so many people here, including so many who have been terrific supporters of the law school and many members of our faculty. You know, we may have been just recently recognized by the New York Law Journal as the second best overall law school in New York, but this Pomerantz lecture, the 16th lecture, is second to none. It's really an outstanding um, occasion every year, 16 of them, it's amazing. It was uh, created and sponsored by the Pomerantz family and his colleagues from the law firm and his many friends, and it honors uh, Abraham L. Pomerantz, who uh, was a giant, and in fact, um, he graduated from Brooklyn Law School in 1924, which is a little while ago. Uh, passed away in 1982, and among his many distinctions is credited with being, and this is no small thing, the founder of the shareholder suit by many people, you know, attributed that to him. So it's really, you know, a big deal. Um, that's like when a guy in the old Andy Cap cartoon said to Andy Cap, I'm the town trunk, drunk, I'm the town drunk, and Andy Cap says, big deal, and the guy says, I live in London, <laughs> you know. So, you know, this is no small thing. Uh, our special thanks go to the Pomerantz Law Firm and its co-managing partners, uh, Jeffrey Lieberman and Patrick Dahlstrom, and the former managing partners, Mark Gross and Stanley Grossman of the class of uh, 1967 for their strong support and encouragement. I want to say just to give you a measure of our high regard for the Pomerantz firm and the support that it's given us. I've been saying to meetings of our alumni and other folks that I've got, in terms of fundraising and support, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is we have all the money we really need. The bad news is that most of it is in your pockets. <laughs> but, but I don't have to say that to the Pomerantz firm uh, because uh, you all have been tremendously supportive, and Stanley, I know especially, we're deeply appreciative for the generous gifts you have and that you will be giving uh, to us in the future, so thank you. Uh, today's Pomerantz lecture will be given by Professor Alan Palmiter, the William T. Wilson III Presidential Chair for Business Law at Wake Forest University School of Law. We're really grateful for you for coming up here and doing this with us, and as you can see from his biography in the program, he's an insightful and prolific corporate and securities law scholar. Professor Palminer um, continues the tradition of distinguished scholars who have previously delivered this lecture. And I'm pleased, especially pleased, very proud to note that his talk will be published in the Brooklyn Law Review. We're fortunate to have as commentators joining us um, two distinguished corporate and securities law scholars in their own right. Professor uh, Tamara Belenfanti, Professor of Law and Co-Director of the Center for Business and Financial Law at New York Law School, and Professor Daniel Greenwood of the Maurice A. Dean School of Law at Hofstra University. Thank you both very much for being with us. Um, thanks to Professors Palminer, Belenfanti, and Greenwood for participating in this uh, annual program this year, and uh, thank you all uh, for having such a a wonderful, big, and I'm sure engaged audience this evening. Um, I am going to run out because uh, I'm going over to the Kings County Bar Association. One of our students, Eric um, Vanda uh, Stowe, is receiving um, a scholarship recognizing his work, which is going to enable him to have a, a public interest, uh, public defender job this summer. And uh, it's a very nice distinction, so I want to be over there and we'll be saying a few words about him and our gratitude to the Brooklyn uh, uh, Bar Association. So I won't be with you, but at this point, I'll say have a great evening and I'll hand it over to Professor Fanto. Well, we'll get to the substance of the talk right away. I just, and I'm just the moderator. I just want to add a few points that, that this, this program is also sponsored by the Brooklyn Law Review and our own Business Law Center, Center for Business Law and Regulation at Brooklyn Law School. 
Now let me just tell you a bit about the format of what we're going to hear. We have my friend Alan Palmiter will be giving the lecture, and that will go for, I don't know, two hours or so? Is that no, 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 no. I, I, I have three hours. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, well, in, in, seriously, it will be more like uh, 25 to 30 minutes. And then we have our two commenters who will, in, in the order of which they're seated, will offer him some comments. We'll let him respond, and then we hope we, we get, we'll take questions from the floor. And then after that, thankfully, then we'll all go upstairs and, and have a cocktail party when, when, when we're done with the questions and comments. So that should, I imagine that will happen around 6.15 or so. Or, okay, so without more ado, Alan, I'm turning it over to you. Um, so th this is a great honor, and I, I should tell you that um, in putting together this lecture, it occurred to me that um, I may be saying three things, one of which is really quite unremarkable, another which is also equally unremarkable, and then a third that is just strange. And I hope that it is uh, worthy of, uh, of our, our collective time. Uh, so uh, here it is. The talk uh, begins by me looking at the uh, EPA's uh, proposal for a clean power plan. And uh, this uh, proposal of, uh, that was uh, initiated in June of 2014, finalized in uh, August of 2015, led me to this, uh, as a, I teach an energy law course, led me to this observation that everybody who you would expect was lining up for and against this sort of centerpiece of the Obama administration's environmental uh, record. Um, and the political economy was kind of what you would expect, except for in the big investor-owned utilities, the big utility companies where a lot of the influence and money resides, were kind of sitting out the, uh, the uh, criticism of the plan, and that led me to wonder what's happening here. So uh, I will describe the plan a bit more and how the political fault lines uh, uh, came to be, and then that led me to this contemplation that um, uh, climate change is, I think, the, uh, one of the great, if not the great moral issue of our times, and uh, a lot of the uh, uh, debate, a lot of what we feel about climate change ends up being very much a question of how we feel about our fellow human beings. It's a moral question. So uh, how was it that the investor-owned utilities made their moral choices about the clean power plan, which is aimed at addressing CO2, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, how is it that these companies made their moral decisions, which led me to this question of moral psychology, a relatively new area of study that um, posits that we human beings, when we make moral decisions, make them um, sort of irrationally. We make them immediately, we make them emotionally, we, we uh, don't really understand what we're thinking, and then we rationalize, we engage in after-the-fact reason justifications for what we've decided, what our moral sort of judgment is. And uh, the, this uh, new area of study, for a long time psychology said we're rational, we make our decisions rationally. It turns out that David Hume, a, a Scottish philosopher, uh, essayist, had it right. Socrates was wrong. Uh, the Enlightenment was wrong. Uh, we are not rational moral decision makers, but instead we are instinctive emotional decision makers. And along what lines do we make our decisions? This is this sort of the basis for my uh, uh, talk and for what will become an article, uh, looking at different kinds of moral foundations, different ideas that guide our judgments and how, as a country, we have come to become politically aligned depending on how strongly we view such things as care and compassion, or liberty and freedom, 
or order and authority or the sacred. And uh, it turns out that uh, political uh, conservatives, liberals, and libertarians have very different moral judgments uh, based on how strongly these vectors play out in their decision making. Which led me then to uh, uh, plumb the depths of the investor-owned utilities response to this proposed clean power plan. And what I identified was something really curious. In their comments to the EPA, the utilities were generally quite conservative. And their language is of political conservatives focusing on order, authority, uh, the sacredness of our Constitution and its federalism, particularly our energy federalism, the relationship between public utility commissions and the EPA. Um, and in their SEC disclosures, they didn't talk the same way. They suddenly became libertarians, concerned about market freedom, about the ability of the companies to respond to climate change on their own without government coercion. And then in their corporate social responsibility reports, which have become as uh, so, sort of uh, important a disclosure document for big uh, corporations, uh, they were quite progressive, quite liberal, and talked about the importance of serving their customers and uh, providing reliable energy, but doing it in an environmentally sensitive way that showed a compassion for the environment. All that stuff about order, authority, liberty, not part of the CSR report. So this was what led me to the final question that I have today. What explains this corporate triple speak? And that's where I hope to end up in, Jim, how many minutes? You'll, you'll, I'll let you know. yeah, you'll let me know. So here it is, the EPA's proposed clean power plan and its political economy. Um, the story here is that uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector is the biggest driver of CO2 pollution in our country uh, and the world. Um, and um, uh, with 31% uh, of CO2 emissions coming from electric generation and most of that carbon dioxide uh, uh, pollutants, um, the uh, EPA finally uh, got off uh, its uh, sort of wait and see attitude during the early part of the Obama administration and came up with a really interesting, innovative, but uh, something the agency had never done before, an unprecedented plan to have each state reduce its emission intensity, that is, to reduce how much CO2 it was emitting given the state's economy. So if a state's economy were to double by the time 1930 or 2030, when there was to be a 32% reduction of CO2 emissions from a 2012 baseline, um, if the state's economy doubled, then its CO2 emissions, you know, you would also expect would go up. These CO2 emissions were tied to the state's um, uh, uh, GDP. And each state was given a target by the EPA for the overall state, not just power plant by power plant, which has been the way the EPA has regulated all other pollutants in the power plant in the uh, electric generation industry. Instead, this was for each state to figure out how to reduce emissions according to a target set by the EPA based on political factors. For example, um, you'll notice uh, Montana is told, uh, you don't have to reduce that much because we know it's gonna be tough for you uh, conservatives in Montana, close to that uh, great uh, coal uh, reserves in uh, the uh, uh, powder basin in, in, in uh, Wyoming, you're, you're going to want to keep on going with coal. We're not going to set a big target for you. But Washington State, you can use the uh, hydropower from the Columbia River. You've only got one coal-powered uh, power plant. You'll close that down. You'll uh, reduce things by a lot. So. Uh, there's the EPA and its plan, and this is um, beyond the fences. This is not uh, saying this is how we regulate what's happening within each facility. This is state by state. You guys come up with a plan that's going to basically go after coal. First of all, we want you to improve the efficiency of your coal-fired power plants 
and um, do that by 6%. If you can't do that, then we want you to switch from coal to combined cycle natural gas, lower CO2 emissions, more efficient, uh, and, um, and if you can't do that, we then want you to uh, uh, increase your nuclear uh, power capacity, and we also especially want you to go and uh, put more renewables into your uh, power portfolio, your generation portfolio, and then finally, um, do something that the EPA had never regulated before. We want you to improve the efficiency of uh, a use of electricity, that is, put in uh, high-efficiency light bulbs, uh, uh, and uh, you know, work on, on getting houses to be better insulated, uh, business to be better insulated. Do all of these things here, the four building blocks in the proposal, and uh, as you can imagine, the White House is all behind this. Uh, uh, this is announced by President Obama in, in the, uh, 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 I guess it was the White Room of the House. Uh, I, one of my friends was there, took a picture of Obama uh, announcing this, uh, a plan that had been significantly drafted by the NRDC, the National Resources Defense Council. So if you're all upset about how conservative uh, groups draft legislation, here's a uh, liberal progressive group, environmental group drafting for the EPA. And the e EPA has in mind that it's going to go out and try to convince everybody that it's got a workable plan. The Solar Energy Industries Association is all lined up uh, as are uh, a number of industries that uh, see this as the future. In fact, I should point out that 2014 was also the year that solar and wind power became less expensive on an unsubsized basis compared to coal and natural gas. It was the turning point. Going forward, the utility industry uh, is not building coal-fired power plants, not because of this clean power plant, but because it's just not financially viable. But against the plan, the uh, uh, Republicans in the US Congress are furious. This is a usurpation of the uh, legislative power. Uh, Murray Energy Corporation gets Larry Tribe, a Harvard Law professor, to say that the plan is unconstitutional in the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. And um, we've got uh, the state attorney generals who are filing briefs, in fact, saying that just uh, the mere proposal of this plan is reason enough under the Administrative Procedure Act to uh, stop it. It is in a final, final rule, but there's a request in the courts to uh, stop the proposal. And there are others in the political economy who you can imagine are lining up. The state of California, Governor Jerry Brown is all for this. Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative uh, in the Northeast, we're all for this. We're moving in this direction anyway. Uh, a number of the public utility commissions said, yeah, we can handle this. You're doing some things that might create uh, uh, reliability problems, but we were headed in this direction anyway. And there are others, including the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, that uh, regulates transmission across interstate lines. This is a problem. Uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce says this is going to destroy our economy as we know it because we'll be paying more for energy uh, making stuff up. But uh, uh, everybody's kind of lining up the way you'd expect them to until you get to the big investor-owned utilities. Their mouthpiece, the Edison Electric Institute, comes out against the plan and says there are a lot of problems here, identifies problems with its legality, with its effectiveness, with its uh, timeline, which pushes state agencies to move forward uh, within uh, just a couple years, by uh, 2020, to implement the plan. Um, but the companies themselves are quite muted. And that's sort of what led me to ask, why didn't the electric utilities, the big ones, react more strongly? So here's my proof to you that this is a moral issue. Here's Pope Francis. His encyclical letter, Laudato Si, is worth your reading. If you do anything else after this lecture, Read Laudato Si. And let me quote from a couple paragraphs. But a sober look at our world shows that the degree of human intervention, often in the service of business interests and consumerism, is actually making our world less rich and beautiful. 
ever more limited and gray, even as technological advances in consumer goods continue to abound limitlessly. In recent decades, environmental issues have given rise to considerable public debate and have elicited a variety of committed and generous civic responses. But politics and business have been slow to react in a way commensurate with the urgency of the challenges facing our world. So there it is. It's, this is a moral issue. These are decisions that involve how we are as humans with other humans. So I had begun reading at about this time uh, this really interesting book on moral psychology by Jonathan uh, Haidt, who uh, was a professor, a psychology professor at Virginia. He was uh, bought out by the uh, NYU Stern of Business, School of Business, uh, to study corporations the most interesting place to study moral psychology. And um, it's kind of interesting from his photo, do you know whether he's left-leaning or right-leaning? It depends on your perspective. Um, so here's his thesis, and it's a very powerful one to me. He begins by reiterating, Socrates was wrong, the Enlightenment was wrong, we are basically emotive, irrational, instantaneous moral uh, decision makers. And, he began by studying cross-cultural differences in moral outcomes and found quite a few, but found also a lot of similarities across cultures and how we uh, make our value-based decisions. Intuitions come first, he observes, then strategic reasoning afterward. And uh, many of you are you know, here in law school, uh, increasing the storehouse of strategic reasons. Somebody will make a decision and then we'll justify it with all of these great legal arguments. It raises the question whether studying legal analysis is worth it, because the decisions are made pre-legal analysis. Kind of weird. I wonder, I've spent 31 years as a law teacher. I've, have I wasted my career? But that's, a, that's another subject. Um, he makes the point that we engage in a lot of motivated reasoning, like a zealous lawyer saying whatever it takes for uh, the, the client, and that's the global norm. Uh, people are generally not rational anywhere. Uh, we do not engage in constructive reasoning. That is, I began from a minor premise, major premise, you know, the syllogistic thinking that we believe law-trained people engage in. That's not happening. It's not us. Um, the dispassionate judge probably doesn't exist. The critical legal studies movement might have been right about how decisions are made. I think they were wrong about a lot of other things. I've been accused of being a crit because of this. I take umbrage. But um, here's where he comes out in describing the moral matrices for our various US political ideologues. Liberals really are moved by stories of caring and compassion. And uh, you know this is to avoid cruelty. This is a liberal person, somebody who also is very concerned about fairness, especially equality. Turns out conservatives are also caring and compassionate people, but their concern about fairness is more about proportionality. Um, conservatives uh, hit these moral vectors, loyalty. Loyalty is super important. And uh, somebody who betrays a uh, trust is, you, you know, unthinkable to a conservative. Uh, authority and chaos, uh, authority is really important, order real important to conservatives, and uh, chaos is what they're trying to avoid. Uh, liberals, by the way, are saying, no, we don't like order. We don't want anybody telling us what to do with our bodies. Uh, sanctity for uh, conservatives, very important, and uh, the concern is the degradation of things held sacred, patriotism, religion, couple of things that come to mind. While well, libertarians are all about freedom, uh, liberty, not being coerced, and especially the value of human uh, liberty in free markets. So there we have it. There's a layout of how political camps fall. And uh, by the way, uh, you know, the hope for us is minuscule politically. Hate makes the point that first we... Uh, sort of bind ourselves into a group and we you know, hear the sort of the, the sounds only of our group, a little echo chamber, only uh, people who we want to listen to. And then 
Once we're bound into that group, we come, become blind to what the other group is saying, feeling, thinking, arguing, because we're emotive, we're intuitive. We are, make these judgments. So here I lay out these six values, and there may be more at play, but uh, hey, uh, hate has identified these six. And I ask you to read this story and feel it in your gut. A man walks down a street and sees a sleeping dog lying on the side of the road. He kicks the dog. How did that make you feel? So if you responded, that is abominable. How can that ever happen? A, a dog, a, you know, if you want to, if you're a cat lover, we could have substituted cat. That identifies a, 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 a liberal, a progressive, moved by stories like that. Should I try another one? Here's another. And these are stories that hate, hate uses to go out and identify people's political leanings and value matrix here and in other places. Here's another story. A father tells his son, do well on the exam and I will buy you a candy. The son does well, but the father does not buy him a candy. So, if you're human, you should have immediately responded to this in your gut. An emotive, intuitive, instinctive uh, response. And if you had responded to it by saying, that's not fair, that's cheating. The son had counted on this. You're taking this from the son's viewpoint. If you're conservative, you might say, no, 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 that's the father's prerogative. He decided for the family what was right. Why did he have to bribe the son to begin with? Maybe the family's finances had changed. Which are you? A libertarian might say, of course, there's a contract. Um, another one. So it turns out the world is mostly conservative. We in the United States are this little strange wrinkle as our, our colleague, our, our, our folks in, in Europe, white, educated, industrial, rich, democratic. Most of the world is not. My third and last story. There are many stories. A woman finds an old American flag in her attic and decides it's too worn to fly. She cuts it into rags to clean the toilet. I asked my mother this. She's got some memory problems. She reacted immediately. She shouldn't do that. But I said, Mom, this is in the privacy of her home. She needed a rag. She shouldn't do that. Well, why not? It's just not right. Some conservatives say, no, you shouldn't do that because it will stuff up the toilet. The flag is sacred. Or a libertarian would say, you can do with your property whatever you want. It's in the Constitution, life, liberty, and pursuit of property. So... These are our political moral matrices, the values that define how we bind and then become blind. Um, for liberals, and I'm using a chart from uh, Haight's book, caring and compassion is super important. Off the charts in terms of how people respond to these kinds of stories. Fairness, liberty, and actually, with respect to loyalty, authority, and sanctity, Liberals say, those are negative values for me. It's very hard to conduct a conversation with somebody who's saying, your values are negative to me, right? The social conservative moral matrix in this country, lots of emphasis on loyalty, authority, sanctity, but folks still love their dogs and their children. And conservatives sort of hit more of these moral vectors. And then, you know, some, you know, free market folks, all they see is, you know, 
I'm my own person. Leave me alone. I'll leave you alone. Do whatever you want. Liberty, oppression, fairness a little bit. The libertarians uh, don't have much to say about the other vectors. So how does this play out in these largest investor-owned utilities? That was the question I had after this kind of surprising result that uh, these folks were sitting out the clean power plant. At least they weren't as aggressive as, you might have ex as I would have expected. And I've talked to uh, friends who teach administrative law. In regulated industries, if you're uh, dealing with something that might affect your business model in a quite serious, significant, negative way, you go all in. These, the largest investor-owned utilities had not. And these are utilities that are both generating electricity transmitting it across interstate lines, delivering it. Um, and what I discovered was something quite interesting. If you read the three ways in which companies were communicating uh, sort of to the public at this time, in their 10Ks, and here's a 10K from Duke Energy from my part of the world, um, look at how Duke, Duke Energy describes the clean power plant. The final requirements of the plan, including the implementation schedule, are uncertain. This is a risk. In addition, it will be several years before the requirements of the state, subsequent state plans are known. Duke Energy is unable to predict the outcome of this rulemaking or how it might impact our utilities, but the impact could be significant. There's no statement here. Duke Energy is funding a, a strong opposition to this plan. Not there nor is there anything about how the plan is aimed at uh, trying to, to address climate change, greenhouse gas emissions. You know, if you focus on these words, uncertain, significant, this is about, you know, effects on shareholders, effects on the company, taking away the company's ability to run its business as it deems fit. I would say this is mostly libertarian. And I have other, in my paper, I hope, for those of you who are on the law review, will convince you that in the 10K, it's mostly a libertarian set of justifications, after the fact, explanations, uh, motivated reasoning. Here's the Duke Energy comments to the EPA, the sort of takeaway um, executive summary. The plan would fundamentally alter how electricity is generated, delivered, and consumed in the country. That wasn't said before. A matter typically left to the states. That federalism issue didn't come up in the 10K. The plan attempts to establish a national energy policy through a section of the Clean Air Act never designed for that purpose. The EPA's proposed um, best standards uh, rules here are unprecedented because it goes after state after by state. It proposes to include the entire electrical system, not just individual electric generating units. This is contrary to 40 years of consistent interpretation, implementation, all kinds of additional problems with the plan. This is all about upsetting tradition, all about creating chaos, all about undoing our great federalism where we give the states these particular roles. And if you, but we're worried about stranding costs for customers. Customers might be forced to pay for plants that we're not going to be using, for me, very, very much conservative. A little bit of unfairness here. It's disproportional. People are going to be forced to pay. Then in the CSR report, uh, we're already reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We support this. We're balancing our customers' rates, the economies of our service, reliability. We have taken a number of significant actions already. Clean, innovative, natural gas plants are being built. Company offers a variety of energy efficiency and conservation programs. We're adding wind and solar. In fact, Duke is adding wind and solar faster than any other utility in the country. And the response, we'll continue to do this. So we're going to work with the EPA on these regulations. This is a different person. And for me, you know, supporting these changes, we're worried about our customers, we're worried about the environment, we're worried about the future. We're doing this in the best interest. Oops. For me, it's so clear. This is, this is a progressive liberal talking. So this is triple speak. And what explains it? So I have 
And meanwhile, Duke, by the way, is funding all of these anti-clean power plan initiatives on the side. So it's spending its money here, but it's saying things there, and it's not going hard itself after the EPA. So what do you make of all of this? And Jim, how much more do I have? I, I will go seven. I will go seven to ten minutes. At ten, at ten minutes, you can yank me off. The podium, I'll be done. So, here are three explanations. You might have others. I would love if you have others. And so you're also thinking to yourself, you know, this is a securities lawyer. He's way out of his element. This is maybe a corporate governance guy. What is he talking about? Clearly, he doesn't know much about energy law. So I'm, I'm way... I don't, I don't know where I am. I don't fit any category, and I would love if somebody were to rein me in. But uh, first of all, maybe these corporate moral matrices conform to the literal ge geographic landscape of the United States. And you're expecting uh, liberal Con Edison to say things different from conservative Southern Company in Alabama and Mississippi and you would find that. Um, but you find some aberrations. Or maybe this is a corporate cacophony that just reflects different functions in the organizational chart. Uh, corporations are, and Tamara will reemphasize this, are systems. And this system has multiple inputs, the utility and multiple outputs, and so when it's speaking to its consumers, it's saying one thing. When it's speaking to its shareholders and the SEC, a different thing. When it's speaking to its regulators, something different. And it just makes sense. You speak. So in that sense, what I discovered might be completely pedestrian and unremarkable. These are political beings conforming to the landscape. These are just companies with far-flung organizational charts, or maybe something more is happening, and this is my thesis, that this internal corporate dialectic, trialectic, is actually an anticipation that the industry will be mutating and will be adapting, and it needs to have some tools, genetic tools, to mutate. And these are the genetic tools, the different sort of ways of describing the moral outlook about this clean power plant. So those are, let me just return to the first of my possible explanations. Here's a political map of the United States, blue and red. We seem to be geographically mostly a red country, um, but the blues are concentrated in population centers. And so if you look at the uh, liberal states, you get liberal utilities. By and large, their comments tend toward concern about the environment, customers, um, sustainable, uh, renewable energy. If you look at the utilities in more red states, in uh, Duke, Southern Company, American Electric Power, more or less what you just saw, a bit of a, uh, of a uh, sort of triple speak, but tending toward conservatism. That's what you'd expect and American Electric Power, quite similar to Duke in the Midwest, Southern Company, even more conservative. But then, here in the midsection, these big utilities, I can't predict the results according to the geography. Berkshire Hathaway, quite liberal. Ah, well, that's Warren Buffett. Exelat, actually, also quite liberal. Um, Dominion Energy, mixed. First Energy, actually, um, quite liberal, maybe, but, but not as liberal as, it's, it doesn't, the geography doesn't explain it completely. It explains it a little, but not completely. So then the next explanation is that Duke Energy is, you know, a typical large corporation with a organizational chart. This is the one that I found it, uh, from a few years ago. And so you'd expect the 10K filing coming from the uh, CEO, the uh, uh, chief financial officer, to be focused on the kinds of things shareholders are used to expect and expecting to, to read. Uh, we're worried about risk. Here are the risks. We can't quantify the risks. Risk, risk, risk. Um, the CSR report prepared by 
the chief sustainability officer um, is, you, not surprising, um, going to be focused on how sustainable we are. That's, this, this is a bit of uh, public relations. Maybe it's greenwashing. Interesting, the CSR report is very clearly also drafted for uh, shareholders and has the boilerplate that's required in uh, shareholder disclosure documents. These are forward-looking statements. We can't be sure of them. We get a safe harbor under the Private Securities Litigation Re Reform Act by doing this. That's the CSR report, kind of interesting. That's now a securities disclosure document. But it's got this other uh, general sort of uh, bent because that's its audience. And then the EPA, the regulatory audience, we're going strong against this, but not as strong as you might have expected. All the punches aren't pulled. Well, that might be because you know it's a regulated industry and you don't want to really piss off the regulator if the uh, regulations actually come to pass. But uh, that's not what I'm told from my administrative law friends you would expect. So maybe this is it. I don't know if you've observed this, <clears throat> but I did. Last year, <clears throat> last year, the oak trees behind our house went nuts. They just threw out acorns like there was no tomorrow. The ground was covered in acorns. I couldn't see the grass. Um, and apparently this is happening in lots of ecosystems. Plants are saying, we don't understand what's happening. This weather is so weird. So our purpose is to perpetuate ourselves. We are here to pass on genes that will create a surviving offspring. And they are sending out seeds like crazy everywhere in the world. Pollen counts are up. If you suffer from pollen from allergies, you will have noticed this. And my biologist friends say this is worldwide. It's uh, the uh, nature's response to weirdness. So, if that's the way nature's responding, maybe we, as part of nature, we're actually these just slightly smarter chimp organisms, um, maybe that's what we're doing too, that we're responding to this new weirdness, and that's what the electric utilities are doing. They are responding to what is likely going to be a radical change in their business model. The centralized uh, utility that generates electricity and then transmits and, and distributes it is probably gone much faster than you can imagine. Uh, solar's taking over, wind's taking over, distributed energy is uh, clearly here. The, these, uh, these companies are closing down coal-fired power plants much earlier than expected because the other generation sources, solar and wind, are cheaper. Something's happening, and even though it wasn't clearly articulated, in any but I saw in just two of the 10 Ks, was there a kind of hint that we are facing catastrophic change? Um, I believe that that's what's happening. So here's Duke Energy. Lynn Good is the CEO, and the... Uh, the man is the one who wrote, and I've forgotten his name, who wrote the uh, sustainability report. The woman below wrote the EPA comments. And they're reflecting different mutant ideas about what the future is for this company, for this industry, in response to this quite dramatic regulatory intrusion and they're not sure which way they're going to go. So they've put on the table for themselves when there's a conversation internally, when there's a presentation to the board, when there's that reflection when you go out on a jog and you come to a realization of what is really happening. They've put on the table, they've thrown out acorns in these three interesting ways conservative, liberal, uh, libertarian. Because I don't think they know which way they'll be headed. There's something happening.
happening here What it is ain't exactly clear Okay, and then it just starts to repeat Sure, I'll offer. Can I get this mic on, or do I have yeah. to no, I think stand so. up? No, they should. It would be awesome. It would be awesome if I stood up. Oh yeah. my goodness. Okay. No, no, you can. I mean, <laughs> well, in that, the moderator. <coughs> the dissonance. The moderator. Moderate. Okay. Okay, I'll stand up. So everyone. Sorry. I don't have PowerPoint, though. I just have <coughs> old-fashioned notes. All right. So I guess. First of all, thank you so much, Jim and Alan, for inviting me to be part of this year's Pomerantz Lecture and to Brooklyn Law School for having me here. I was saying to Jim and to Dan, my fellow commentator, that I live right around the corner, but I've actually never walked through the gates of Brooklyn Law School. So really a pleasure to, to be here. Um, let me first offer some general reflections and then I'll get into more specific comments. I'll throw in a little bit of systems theory, and then I'll leave you with two questions. All I'm going to try to do within five minutes to leave room for Dan and to room for odd questions from the audience. So in terms of general reflections, my goodness, I learned a lot. So when Alan first contacted me and said, hey, will you be a commentator? I'm writing this piece on electric utility companies. My first reaction was, heck no, I know nothing about electric utility companies. What could I possibly have to offer? And what these last few weeks have done is I've learned a lot about electric utility companies, and it's gotten me thinking as to how this relates to my own work, which is corporate governance, corporations, and communities, and last two and a half years in this world of thinking of corporations as systems and what that means if we apply systems methodology to get at some of these confusing behaviors about corporations, their purpose, and how we measure their performance. So thank you for that opportunity. Also, last night I decided to take Hyde's test on the righteous mind. And after I got through the registration, and I'm always skeptical, I'm like, why are they asking me all this information? But after I got over that hurdle and I registered and I was able to get into the test, I encourage you to all go ahead and do this test. And I was doing the test, and I was doing it as I was simultaneously flipping channels. And I didn't know if anybody was flipping channels last night, but it was all this debate about the NFL and people kneeing or should you sit? And I was like, oh my goodness, these people should take the test because it was just bind blind, bind blind. And I was like, nobody will ever come to any kind of consensus because they're just relying on their own values and moral matrix. So it was really interesting to see this playing out today in another sector of our social economy. And the last general comment is, oh my goodness, what a great mashup this paper is, mashup in the sense that it's a cross-pollination, as you mentioned, of constitutional law, corporate law, securities regulation, environmental law, admin law, energy law, and I'm like, I don't know if anybody uses that who's money when one else enter law school. It's like, I think it's a, not the best book for teaching people that law comes in many different flavors and one problem actually activates many different areas of law. I'm like, this is a great way of teaching new law students how we actually access law and think about how law is interconnected. So those are my general thoughts. So now for specific comments. So the first specific comment is, I think what we're observing with these electric utility companies and particularly this investor-owned electric utility companies is a microcosm of the larger whole. And the larger whole for my purposes meaning the corporate system. What they're doing is they're trying to navigate, as you hint at, these changing norms maybe, changing attitudes, and they're not quite sure how it's going to land, which is why they're putting out all these acorns, right? And 
And they're not the only ones doing it. Corporations and like food and beverages came to mind, right? So Pepsi has this beautiful performance with purpose. And if you read it, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm going to eat Cheetos and I'm going to drink Pepsi and they have my back. And then you read their 10K and you're like, no, 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 no. What happened? Right? So they're engaging in it in different industries. So I do think it is a small sample set, if you will, of a larger whole. And you're right, it's telling us something. The second comment that comes to mind is, as with any system, and system in a very technical sense of the word, system meaning something that has distinct elements that are interconnected and that operate to form some unified whole. And that thing is performing some specific purpose. So as with any system, what systems theory will tell you is that systems, so we all are systems. My husband hates to think, he's like, what do you mean, no, we're humans. I'm like, yes, but we, we are systems, right? We have different parts and we're, all our parts are put together to form some unified whole. If you took those parts apart, a heart on its own is just a heart. It's not a human body. And you can carry this analysis and think of different things from like a coffee machine. If it's just the water filter part of the coffee machine, then it's just the water filter. But when taken together with the pods and the different systems that go into it, the subsystems, ah, now you can get hopefully a hot cup of coffee. So systems, what systems theorists will tell you, is that systems have multiple purposes. And the purpose that they exhibit actually may change over time. And it actually may change depending on the forum. So I think that's one of the things that we're seeing here. Where, yes, their end goal may be the pursuit of shareholder value, so they have to appeal to their shareholder base. At the same time, what shareholder value means, they may view it as changing as more impact investors come into the market. They also need to appeal to, as you mentioned, their regulators. And the thing that's going to work with the regulators, it may not be the same type of express purpose that's going to work with the shareholders, et cetera, et cetera. And then my third specific point had to do with mutation. So much to say here. I think it's fascinating that they're changing, they're adapting, they're throwing out acorns, right? They're trying to figure it out. They're literally and figuratively trying to see where something will land and where something will stick. And I submit that in many ways, this is what corporate systems do. They're constantly trying to adapt and change. And so some examples I give my students and I talk about in my work are mergers, right? They're adapting, they're changing. We don't think of them as an adaptation or survivable or survivability mechanism, but that's what's going on. Going private transactions is another one. Tax inversions that everybody was like up in arms about last year, right, and year before, eh, they're just kind of trying to do something to adapt, change, respond. These new organization forms that we see proliferating, right? So benefit corporations, social purpose corporations, right? The rebirth of corporatives. They're kind of just trying to figure out how to mediate these changing norms and attitudes. So as I said to Alan, we spoke a little bit earlier today that I would actually encourage him to go further. It's not just about mut mutation or adapt adaptation. The end game is survivability. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to gain the larger system to survive. So, two specific questions. As they're using this different speech in these different fora, right? So, it occurred to me, like, one way to describe it is, oh, they're just doing speech diversification. Just like investors are taught to do Investment diversification, right? You don't put all your eggs in the proverbial one basket. That's all they're doing. They're hedging their bets. They're, doing, they're engaging in this speech diversification. And linked to that thought, 
was another thought, which is, and by the way, they do this in other aspects of their life. And the other aspects of their life that really occurred to me was in accounting, where they have internal accounting speech, which is going to look different from their IRS accounting speech, which, by the way, looks different from their GAP accounting speech. So they're doing this. And so the question is, is there something different about what they're doing here versus, and we can just take the accounting world as one representative example. So that's question number one. And then question two is a little bit more esoteric, I will admit, which is, what, if anything, does this reveal or how does this help us think about the larger debate on corporate personhood and identity? And I'm going to stop there and I'll save some additional questions if we have time for later. So thank you. I usually refuse to stand behind podiums because they make me look even smaller than I am. So, um, so this is this is special for you. So what a what a rich and wonderful investigation. Uh, thank you so much um, to the the uh, the law school and uh, to Jim and to Alan uh, and to everybody who's made this this uh, possible. I really appreciate the the lecture and the uh, work that it reports on, uh, and and Alan's uh, really. Important important contribution here. But having said that, I'm going to start on a down note. Um, the, the, um, the emotional impact of reasoning that hate points to is clear and seems to me fundamental. But still, uh, hate matrix doesn't speak to me. To, to my mind, uh, virtually all of us work within a dichotomy between what we might call uh, friend or in-team morality uh, the rules applying to us and our group, uh, and stranger or other pe team uh, mores, the, the rules that apply between us uh, and those who are not us, who are not on our team. Uh, and the former group uh, involve uh, many of the, the values that hate um, discusses. It certainly includes loyalty, charity, mutual sacrifice, compassion, uh, liberals, conservatives, libertarians, uh, other groups that you might identify, all, it seems to me, would look askance at parents who seek equality or fairness in the gifts that they give to their children and what their children give back. That's not the right way you think about, to think about your relationship with your children. Nobody thinks that hogging the ball is proper team spirit, that you should be, just be thinking about yourself, or admires soldiers who put their own self-interest ahead of the platoon's safety. Uh, the, the, so the, the, the in-team morality is a set of concepts uh, that it seems to me crosses the, the hate list there, neither conservative nor, um, nor uh, liberal, or maybe both. Uh, similarly, the, the across-team, the out-of-team mores, the, the rules between strangers or opponents, uh, uh, can be fair play. Um, the rules according to Hoyle or the playing fields of Eaton Justice is fairness, blind justice, neutral principles, the same sauce for the goose and the gander, those kinds of things. Um, alternatively, and quite dramatically differently, uh, these can be the rules of war. Just smash them. Just smash them. Um, but all of hate's groups, it seems to me, share both of, or I guess these are three, sets of um, moral responses in the right context. It's the context that counts, uh, much more so than the personality. To my mind, then, the uh, main left-right distinction is not whether we value loyalty or caring or freedom. Um, I, I guess I'm a more optimistic lawyer. I, I think that the reason the law works is because we all value all of those rules. That's why you can talk to people, at least in their more rational moments, uh, who you disagree with in your less rational moments, uh, or who you even disagree with in your most rational moments, right? You can talk to people who you disagree with precisely because these underlying values are actually not 
um, only the province of this group or that group, but shared. Um, the contrasts, it seems to me, are not between us, but within us. So Rawls's abstract fairness, at least in theory of justice, uh, stopped at the national borders, and it didn't extend to inside the family. Uh, Samuel Johnson's insight into American politics, he said, he said at the time of the revolution, right? How is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes? Still a um, question that we might ask about ourselves. Reflects a reality that we know well, and it makes sense only because the conflict is within us, not between us. Similarly, it's virtually impossible to find an American who does not believe that markets are useful. You know, Haight calls that the libertarian moment. I've never met a libertarian. There practically aren't any as far as I can tell. But there isn't an American who doesn't believe that markets are useful. Similarly, though, I would say, there isn't an American who isn't happy, just like these energy companies, to avoid markets or to change the background rules when they don't like the existing market's results. American libertarians, to the extent they exist, never call for free markets in on-street parking or nuclear power plants or military bases, even if it is now kind of popular to uh, call for state funds to support private schools and private military forces. Nobody actually wants to use markets when markets don't give the results that they want, or at least they don't want to use those markets unless they can change the markets to give different results. Instead, it seems to me, our tribes are separated by whether we define our team broadly to include all Americans, or even all of God's creations, or whether we define them narrowly to exclude coastal and city dwellers, elite eaters of arugula, immigrants, our melanin-enhanced compatriots, people with unusual sexual tastes, or with standards, familial divisions of labor, or even anyone who doesn't swear ongoing allegiance to the current president and his latest tweet. That's what really separates us. Are we defining our team broadly or narrowly? Uh, secondly, I would say hate's trichotomy misses some really key drivers of American politics that we see in this context as well. The context over racism, patriarchal family and business relations and theocracy are nowhere in here. The battle within the business elites, this is the, really the key one, between those who recognize that rules of good behavior, Hoyle and Eaton, are essential to say, successful markets, and the remarkably large part of American business class that more or less self-consciously is in the business of grift. It's success depending on its ability to cheat and get away with it on externalizing pollution or safety or cleanup or infrastructure and training costs, on misleading consumers, on shifting risk to those least able to understand it, as so much of our financial industry does, on paying employees less than their replacement cost, on avoiding paying a fair share of taxes, the price of civilization, on monopolistic IP rights or cascades and franchises, on shrink rack arbitration agreements or strategic bankruptcy, to avoid ordinary contract law, on assisting their clients, as too many of us do in our professional lives, in avoiding these or other generally applicable laws. We have a serious division between those who want to maintain the system that makes our affluence possible and those who simply want to exploit it. Finally, it seems to me that hate's schema misses much of what's going on. By describing today's radical right as motivated by respect for authority or sacred traditions, he's actually ignoring the, the, the real projects. There is no respect for the sacred in trashing our national monuments by allowing mining in them, in refusing to accept the, the need to protect our ecosphere, or in insulting the families of wounded soldiers, soldiers or of XPOWs, in vast militaristic spectacles at sport games, sports games, or at using the symbols of the country to sell uh, products or divisive political platforms. Those are not about celebrating sacred traditions. The Confederate flag is a symbol of disloyalty, not loyalty. Cooperating with the Russian government or neo-Confederates to subvert American elections and prevent Americans from voting, that's actual disloyalty, not loyalty. 
aiming guns at federal officers refusing to pay rent for use of American lands, let alone dismantling our public schools, defunding higher education, destroying civil service independence or government expertise. These are precisely the opposite of respect for authority. So defining the left and the right as a controversy over sacred symbols, asserting that it's only the left or that it is the left that uh, finds sacred to be a negative value or authority to be um, uh, something not to be valued, uh, seems to me to miss the point. All right, now all of that I probably should have addressed to hate rather than to Alan, because uh, it really doesn't have that much, to my mind, to do with the valuable part of his paper. Uh, I think the paper is profoundly interesting, regardless of hate, who really isn't terribly critical to it. Uh, and so I want to not use all my time to talk about the other guy. Um, so first, the obvious point, and, and really, uh, Alan was deprecating about it, but I think it's enormously important. He is specifically and explicitly considering corporate governance as an imperfect, potentially conflictual system of multiple actors who may or may not be acting at let alone achieving unified action. This is quite unusual in the field, despite Tamara's uh, work. And, and, uh, and I think the, the, simply recognizing the point that what we're seeing here may be a failure of corporate governance um, is already, or maybe corporate governance as it really works rather than as um, we're used to describing it, uh, may be an, a, a tremendously important advance in itself. To be sure, at least since Burke, pointed out that the managers of the East India Company got insanely wealthy while the company and its investors and especially its Indian subjects suffered, um, at least since Burke, corporate governance scholars have worried at the bone of self-interested managers lining their own pockets instead of pursuing the common interest. But generally, the assumption has been that corporate interest is uncomplicated, set by the board, vetted by the stock market, available to all, without internal conflict or struggle or even self-deception, cognitive dissonance, um, the kinds of battles that we have within ourselves to suppress the cancers that could potentially take us over, to suppress the mental illnesses that could distract us from um, our usually conflicting and um, uh, conflicted goals. Um, so I think it's terribly important that Alan begins his inquiry by wondering if the different responses of the same company in different contexts are not simply cognitive dissonance, different people expressing different professional competencies, no common meaning at all, or as he puts it, uh, multiple acorns sent out to st in, a, in a kind of competition, I assume, to see what will, um, what will prevail. Uh, is this a single speaker at all? Or is it something uh, that shouldn't be thought of in that unified way, in the same way that we really, uh, at least our moral psychologists, uh, no longer think of human beings in that kind of unified way. Um, still, still, as Alan points out, um, most of these bureaucratic actors must have internal mechanisms for generating some degree of internal consistency. At a minimum, um, securities lawyers must be reviewing the various statements, right? Um, that's why they come out sounding uh, that way, to assure that combined they don't amount to misleading or fraudulent disclosures. And I, and I do have to say, I'm, I'm with Alan, it seems to me there's room for some securities lawyer to, uh, and some tort lawyers to read these things carefully and see whether the internal mechanisms have actually uh, worked in this respect. So Alan's questions are critical. Do the different approaches he finds reflect something about the way these firms are approaching the new world we're entering? Or Alternatively, something about the modern rhetoric of law and politics, or are they simply epiphenomenon? Now, academically, I'm more interested actually in how the rhetoric works. Uh, but as a citizen, I'm mainly encouraged that Alan's excerpts suggest that at least to some extent, these firms are acting as we hope businesses in a mixed capitalist economy will act, and not as we fear they will. That is, even though they are clearly making some attempt to use their influence on state agencies to resist the inevitable churn of the market, and rather frighteningly, to slow the process of adjustment to a new energy regime, uh, a new energy regime that we need 
in order to avoid climate catastrophe. Uh, they don't seem to be resisting change with the ferocity of, say, General Motors in 1975 or Philip Morris for the half century after 1950. Um, while it's easy to hear in his excerpts the defensiveness of managers seeking to avoid responsibility for legacy investments that are about to be stranded and should never have been made in the first place, that isn't the only thing we see. That isn't the only thing that Alan is showing us. Schumpeter taught us that established companies have a great deal of difficulty adjusting to new worlds. And indeed, that is the standard uh, understanding of Darwinian evolution as well. Usually, the economy, like science, advances one corporate death at a time by Darwinian rather than adaptive or social psychological mechanisms. But it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. I'm a little skeptical that trees have purposes and that they send out uh, uh, acorns in a conscious attempt to um, uh, deal with a changing environment. Maybe because I have a little trouble understanding the consciousness of trees. Uh, but it's not hard to imagine that companies could do that, even though we know that most companies have a lot of trouble doing it. We are going to have to shift to vastly greater use of solar, wind, geothermal, hydrogen power, and much of this is going to be de decentralized. That decentralization could be a tragedy for these companies, but it could also make the legacy distribution networks even more important than they were before. Balancing multiple fluctuating sources of demand, many of which will no longer be subject to simple bureaucratic top-down command and control direction. Allen's borrowed ideological framework labels markets as an aspect of the entirely fringe libertarian personality. But I'm going to make a plea for markets here. The complexity of the distribution problem uh, we are facing in the near future seems to demand something more like markets than command and control. Um, the companies are going to have to find something like an um, internal market or something similar to match supply and demand. Uh, the authority structures that they used in an old era in which there was only one source uh, are simply not going to work anymore. Can we hope that the leadership of Duke and the other energy companies are beginning to think in terms of adaption rather than resistance? Or is it ultimately, that is the energy companies, ultimately going to follow the militantly anti-capitalist path of seeking to use the EPA and hollow claims of state rights, the federalism that nobody believes in, that Duke can't even maintain for a full paragraph without reverting back to, oh, and by the way, if you would give us some national instructions that we like, that would be better yet. Uh, are we ultimately, are they ultimately going to follow that anti-capitalist path to protect incumbent profits at the expense of social welfare? Will it turn out that the shareholder profit norm is a cancer that destroys its host? Or will we find a way to overcome? Uh, Alan's investigation here, it seems to me, is of something enormously important um, and surprisingly hopeful. So, thank you. Alan, do you want to take a few minutes to respond? Tamara Dan, thanks very much. And uh, in similar ways, I think you identified the tough question for me, and that's the personhood question. And that is ultimately a question about how, in groups, how are we different from the cacophony, the many voices, the dissonances that we have internally as individuals. Uh, I originally had a slide with James Joyce, and I was inviting you to think of what's happening in Duke as this stream of consciousness just going every which way. Uh, but um, that may be the, the tough question. And I'm, I'm, I really, apparently there's been some analysis of this, of how group decision-making works, particularly in corporations, and um, it's apparently 
uh, top down, and it's, it, it doesn't seem to resolve for me what I've heard of it. I haven't read it yet. Uh, the, the question of what is the corporate person in terms of making these decisions in a context. I agree that these are very contextual decisions. Um, and so you identified the uh, uh, sort of soft underbelly of my investigation. I still don't understand what this person is. Um, I agree it's maybe a system, but it's a weird system. And I agree that, uh, thank goodness, I don't have to uh, hang all of my uh, argument on, on whether uh, Jonathan Haidt is right or wrong. <laughs> I just use that as a tool to do some, some sort of measuring. But um, uh, understanding group decisions uh, is super important, I think, for this inquiry in, in general, for, for, our, for our future. Why don't we see if uh, we have any member of the audience who would like to ask a question? Ted, would you? So, let me pick up. Maybe on. just speak up. I don't know if we have a mic. Wait, do you have a mic? Oh, I can talk really loud. Why don't you <laughs> can? But I think we want to record it okay. too. So your, this, this picks up on uh, what Alan uh, uh, just said, um, which is the question of personhood and how that's going to vary based on styles of leadership within the firms. There was a, you had a little throwaway comment that I thought was really interesting, which was, oh, Berkshire Hathaway, that's just Warren Buffett, as opposed to Duke Energy, where you basically had a typical corporate CEO who did, said what corporate CEOs say, you had the general counsel who responded the way general counsels respond. And so you have a difference between a corporation where you've got a leader who has a personality who will then engage in acts of corporate citizenship as opposed to a corporation with a different leadership style where a bureaucratic politics model might be more explanatory. And I guess a question I would have for you or for everybody is are there ways that we can think about corporate governance in a way that would make either work across those styles or, 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 or encourage a, con, a, a converging on some sense of transparent corporate personhood? So I, I know this mic works. <laughs> Ted, Ted, that's a terrific question. I have an answer and maybe Dan and Tamara have one too. Turns out that Lynn Good, the CEO of Duke Energy, was in her first year as CEO when this all happened. And I think that she was kind of feeling her way. It's really interesting. My paper begins with, it is August 2nd, 2015. And I'm not going backward. I'm going backward in time. I'm not going forward in time in the paper because so many other rich things have happened. I don't, I, I'd be overwhelmed. But um, Turns out that she actually decided to take the company decidedly toward the CSR vision rather than the EPA comments decision with sort of a recognition, as both Tamara and Dan were pointing out, that the shareholders are viewing their corporations in a new way. And so she's responding to a new context, finding herself as a new stronger woman in this role. And Duke Energy actually joined Ceres and is part of this move to uh, become a sustainable corporation, has adopted a roadmap forward. Um, so you were right on it. Anybody else? You want to speak? Can I just show Yeah, please. Yeah, you, okay. you have a few, <laughs> I know. Go ahead. <laughs> But you're going to have to take the hand mic here. Well, I don't know if it's worth all of this because it's just a quick response. Um, about So what to do with corporate governance? If we assume we're in some kind of changing world, shifts in dynamics, which I, I do think we are for a variety of reasons. So I view it as an opportunity for the corporate governance system, if you will, 
to reevaluate how we think about the subsystems that we're trying to address. The main subsystem for me being each corporate entity. And as a lot of other people have said, one big thing is we assume a certain level of homogeneity. And it's really time to disaggregate that, I would say. And yes, they're coming with a basic set of defaults and background rules. I often tell my students that you should really think of them like building with Legos. So they're basic building blocks that you need to build them. But after you've put in your basic building blocks, you can get fancy and you can do different things. And we can't assume that each one is the same. So I do think a move to more a heterogeneous view of what it means to be a corporation would bode well for the corporate governance system. to think about that one a little bit because so I, think that's, I think that's an important uh, important thought so but I had a, a different thought about the legal personality issue and that's this the 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 corporate governance structure is created by law and the law privileges some corporate participants over others in particular the structure that we've created is a CEO centric structure in which the CEO matters um, in a way that we don't see in other um, governance structures. We certainly don't see it in states anymore, except perhaps in uh, Saudi Arabia. We've basically abolished the, the, um, the uh, absolute sovereign, uh, largely because it didn't work. Uh, and yet here we have a system in which um, that's really, really a, a defining characteristic of the corporation as we know it. Um, and so uh, uh, bureaucratic infighting is there, to be sure, as it is in Saudi Arabia as well, and as it, as it uh, characteristically was in all the courts of, of the absolute monarchs. Um, but it has the, the, the typical corporation, almost all of them, have the usual problems of uh, aristocratic courts. Um, too many people who, who can only succeed by saying to the person at the top what the person at the top wants to hear, and too little possibility for the person at the top to actually hear what they need to hear. Um, one, one piece of this um, that, that it really is striking to me is that um, consumers have no voice whatsoever in the energy system, uh, which is basically monopolistic, right, that, um, that Alan is describing. And so in, in other parts of the economy, they at least have a voice in their role as consumers, as purchasers. Here, even that's missing. So this is really a, a, an astonishingly uh, unique voiced uh, set of inputs, even though Alan is pointing out some um, uh, uh, varying voices coming out. Um, in a time of rapid change and crisis, it may be that part of what we need to be thinking about is ways of getting more voices inside the corporation, uh, something that would allow uh, a more robust debate to happen without it being entire, entirely focused on um, how do I keep my job and get my next promotion? I have one quick thought. Put a solar panel on your house and you'll get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think then I want to thank all of you for coming. I'd like to thank the speaker and the commenters. And then we... <laughs>